The Son and the Holy Spirit, one. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, help us, Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Lord, make us worthy to pray, thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. I will be. Bless this day our daily bread and our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. There is no temptation to the rest of us. Is Christ our Lord? Let us give thanks to the gracious and merciful God, the Father, of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. He has protected us so and accepted us. The question of mercy, Lord, is in the world. This was the last name of the mighty God, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Father, of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you on every occasion and every need all things. He has protected us so and accepted us. compassion upon us. Therefore, we ask and appeal to the Lord remain. To prove it, the days of the Lord. in your feet. Will there be all temptation, all the Satan, all the intrigues of the rising of the Lord? You cast away from us and from us. Turn us in down with some affection. Father, give us some temptation to the rest of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and love remain calm and impermanent. I will go and save Jesus. Glory on unto me, in my life, 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 God, according to your loving kindness, in too much to do, I must blot out my transgressions, sorry for my sin, for I can't. Against you, only have I sinned, and yourself. Behold, I was brought forth, in my life, I can see you drawing gladness at the French trip for Camaro. I do a place. Bring me a clean heart, O God, and renew the last spirit within me. Not cast me away from your presence, and not take the full spirit. So to me, the joy of your salvation, of course, will be true. Now I see you transgresses your ways and so to you. Give me the love of the God of my soul. I touch with God over righteousness. O Lord, open my lips to the master of the Lord. Do not desire sacrifice or so give. Do not divine him that offering. Broken and contrary heart, these of God do not despise. To the walls of Jerusalem, and show we please the sacrifices of righteousness. Don't suffer him and hold my trouble. You shall offer fools on your own. Alleluia. The eleventh hour of this blessed day is offered to Christ my King, my God, and him to my sin. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. For the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. Testimony of Israel. Thanks. 
The thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. Because the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And the Lord. And to you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of a servant looks to the hands of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hands of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God, and to you have mercy on us. Mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. We have seen any of your hand. Our soul is a fit. It is one of those very content of the proud. Alleluia. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, the men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive. And their wrath was kindled against us, and the waters would have overwhelmed us. Dream would have gone over us. All the waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us prey to Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We made heaven and earth. Hallelujah. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. Now he arose from the scene of and entered Simon's house. For Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. The maid requested him concerning her. He stood over her and rebuked the food when he left her. Immediately she arose and served them. Now when the summer was setting, all those that only were sick with various diseases. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Glory be to God for a fine man. Ten oshtem oko bechrestos nebek yoten agathos nebia nemais the web giakia sotiem monaina. If the righteous one escapes saved, where shall I dismiss thee? For me, weakness not going to bear the burden here today. But you, the merciful God, count me among those eleventh hour. Your mother conceived and gave birth to me. I should not dare look up to heaven, but because of your great mercy and love to humanity, I call to you, saying, Lord, who my sins and my mercy upon me. Look, sir, but three, okay, okay, Take me to my Saviour into fatherly embrace, because I spent my life in pleasure and desires. My time is running out, now I depend on a rich and infinite compassion. Do not disregard a humble heart and need your mercy. Cry to you with reverence, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. Any care, I care, so see on a stony on an amen. I practice evil with diligence and enthusiasm, with earnestness and keenness, I committed a sin. For this I deserve suffering, condemnation. Our Lady Virgin Mary, guide me to the knees of repentance. Here I plead through a sick supplication. I call you for help, lest I fail. Come to my rest, my soul to pass from my body. Be the conspiracy of the enemy, shut the gates of hell, lest I swallow my soul. I blame as part of the true Lord. O oh Lord, hear us and have mercy upon us. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. 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 Kiria Laison, 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 Kiria Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. God the Father Almighty, have mercy upon us, O Holy Trinity, have mercy upon us. O Lord God of hosts, be with us, fill us with our tribulations, verse of you. O God, is over me, if you use our sins, which you have done willingly and unwillingly, those who have knowingly and unknowingly, hidden and invisible. O Lord, who gives us the sake of your holy name, that's called upon us, and according to mercy and not to our sins. Our Father, who art in heaven, and thy will. Bless us, thank you, Holy Spirit. We feed those who trust in you. Here's one's protection.
Thank you, compassionate Lord, for your grant us past this day in peace. For us, thankfully, for the might, most worthy of seeing your light until sunset. Of his glorification, we now offer you and save us from the temptation of the enemy. He always traps it against us. In this coming night, give us peace without pain, or anxiety, fatigue, or delusion. May we pass the night in peace and chastity, and awake to praise you and praise you. At all times and everywhere, we glorify and praise your name, the Father and the Holy Spirit, forevermore. Amen. Have mercy upon us, O God, have mercy upon us. For us to wish him glorified in heaven and on earth. O Christ, our good Lord, patience and patience. Love is just and shows mercy to all sinners among the first. Was not which have been all sorts of salvation possible in the world. The Lord has set out prayer to say on every hour. He is our lives and guide us back to what we do command. Sanctify our souls, purify our bodies, set right our thoughts, cleanse our intentions, you are sick and our sins. Deliver us from every evil group and destruction. Grant us with the holy angels and God and God over them. Then you need your faith and knowledge of your God bless you for a Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for bringing us here today. We ask you, Lord, to put minds of the speakers today and Marie and Maria so that they can pass on the Holy Spirit and guide us, dear Lord, be to prepare ourselves for the, for the coming Pascha and make us worthy to pray thankfully. Father, Lord, heaven, let be thy name. Okay, right, guys, count of three. One, two, three. Oh, seek to me, Jesus, forget your hunger. Prepare. 
blessed are you if you are prepared. Blessed are you if you are prepared. Blessed are you if you are prepared. His heart is longing for you. Blessed are you if you are prepared. You're a part in Jesus Christ. You who live among the rocks have no fear from all dangers. You're protected by the Lord. You're protected. How could I forget the one who died for me? How could I forget his side that had to be? How could I forget the one who died for me? How could I forget his side that had to bleed. He who saw me in my misery, and he came running to me. He who bought me and redeemed me, broke my chains and set me free. He who saw me in my misery, so he came running to me. He who bought me and redeemed me, broke my chains and set me free. How could I forget your kindness through the years? Your eyes and always reaching out to me. How could I forget your kindness through the years? Your right hand always reaching out to me. In my joys and in my sorrows, in all of life's storms, you've become my friend and fortress. You're the one to whom I hold In my joys and in my sorrows In all of life's storms You've become my friend and fortress You're the one to whom I hold Help me, Lord, I want to lose myself in you for my pride has blinded me from seeing you. Help me, Lord, I want to lose myself in you. For my pride has blinded me from seeing you. So I'll keep watching and praying, setting my eyes on you. Trusting in your sure promise that you'll be back for me soon. So I'll keep watching and praying, setting my eyes on you, O Lord. Trusting in your sure promise, you'll be back to take me home. So I'll keep watching and praying. 
king, setting my eyes on you, trusting in your sure promise that you'll be back for me soon. So I'll keep watching and praying, setting my eyes on you, O Lord, trusting in your sure promise you'll be back to take me home. Thanks guys, that was beautiful and very relevant. Um, so as we're used to, we are part of oh, a chapter from Sirach, every, um, every Bible study. Firstly, welcome to the last Bible study for two weeks, yeah, after today. So we're going um, we're gonna to be having Passion Week to, next week. Um, and I think it's two weeks that we're not doing Bible study. I'll confirm that. Um, and then we'll um, serve all your... Only one week, is it? Should be only one. All right, we'll see. I'll confirm. I've been told to. No way. <laughs> but we're blessed tonight with Anne talking to us about Sirach. And I can't remember the chapter. 21. We're already 21. If we, like, if we do another five chapters of Sirach, we're halfway there. Halfway through the year of Sirach. Yeah. All right. Thank you, um, Anne. So Sirach chapter 21 is split into two major sections. The first is from verse 1 to 10, which talks about fleeing from sin. And Sirach basically tells us to pray and flee from sin and to be careful and to know when we've slipped and come back, etc. And at the end of the section, he basically says that anyone who continues in their sin will end up in hates which Christ basically says when he tells us, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. So I'll just talk about two verses in this section and then go to the next section. Um, verse 1, he says, My son, you have sinned. Sorry, my son, have you sinned? No longer add to them, but pray about your former sins. So when he says pray about your former sins, He's, he means repentance. Um, Pope Carolus explains this quite well. He says, If you happen to fall into temptation, do not let guilt of sin be an obstacle to prayer. If you cease praying till you repent, you will never repent, for prayer is the door to genuine, genuine repentance. And verse 2, verse 2 is quite descriptive. He says, flee from sin as you would from the presence of a snake. For if you approach it, it will bite you. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, destroying the souls of men. So he's basically showing how destructive sin is and how walking towards it or, or willingly going towards sin destroys us. So he very well describes it, but the question is, how do we flee from sin? And I think James explains it quite well. In James 4, 7, he says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's basically three points. The first point and most important point to be able to flee from sin is to first submit to God. Because if you think about this this um, verse submission and resistance are basically the exact opposite to each other so if we submit to god then we'll follow his commandments we'll want to get closer to him we'll want to please him we'll want to do his will and build a relationship with him but if we don't wish to submit to god then we're resisting god and submitting to the devil so it's either we submit to God and resist the devil or we resist God and submit to the devil. You can't do both. So the first step to be able to flee from sin is to submit to God and get, come closer to God. 
because trying to flee from sin without doing that is going to be impossible. And then as a result of submitting to God is the second step, we resist the devil. And then through patience and persistence in those two, eventually the devil himself will flee from us. But it goes in that order. We can't try and resist the devil without first submitting to God and the devil isn't going to run away because he wants to do anything to let us fall. So the second section in this chapter talks about wisdom and foolishness and that goes from verse 11 to 28. Um, he basically compares... It's basically a series of comparisons and contrasts between wisdom and folly. So I'm just going to talk about two of those. Um, in verse 19, he says, To a foolish man, instruction is like chains on the feet and like handcuffs on the right hand. So it's basically a foolish man can't accept instruction. And the reason for that is... A pride pers a proudful person, a prideful person, um, always thinks of themselves very highly. So if someone tells them to do something, they think, "No, I'm better than you. You, you have no right to tell me what to do," and that in itself is foolish. On the other hand, in verse twenty-one, it says, "To a wise man, instruction is like a golden ornament, and like a bracelet on the right hand." So for someone who's wise, instruction is very valuable to them and that's because a wise person is humble. So no matter how old they are, no matter how educated they are, they always feel like there's more to learn and they can be better. They never feel like they're perfect. So any instruction for them is, is a good thing. And in Psalm 141, it says, Let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. So it shows the value again of instruction for a wise and humble person. Um, the second part, this, the second comparison is um, the heart of fools is in their mouth, but the mouth of the wise is in their heart. So I could, didn't really understand this at first, but um, if you split it up, it makes more sense. So the heart of fools is in their mouths. So basically it's saying that a foolish person is always saying what's on their, on their minds, what's in their heart. It basically reminds me of that saying, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, her, he wears his heart on his sleeves or she wears his heart on his sleeves. So they're always saying whatever they think, whatever they feel, whatever's in their heart. And that's foolish because often saying everything, it can lead to problems for themselves or other people because they could say the wrong thing or they could just say too much. Um, and that's not wise. But the next part it says, but the mouth of the wise is in their heart. So this reminds me of St. Mary. The mouth of the wise is in their heart. If we think about St. Mary, she didn't speak hardly at all. And every time she witnessed something or heard something, the Bible actually says to us that she pondered these things in her heart. So it's really nice for us to learn this from St. Mary, this wisdom that whenever we hear things or see things, rather than talking about it, as I'm sure St. Mary would have loved to boast about her son, she pondered them in her heart, so we should do the same, ponder everything in our hearts. And if we want to talk to anyone, we talk to God. And glory be to God for Thank you very much, Anne. All right, guys, so we are now at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. Yeah? We're at this point where where um, Jesus is going in and out of Jerusalem. He is um, very, very close now to um, the point at which he will um, be crucified. Okay, it's very relevant going into Passion Week next week. Um, 
But tonight we're, we're very blessed with Maria um, talking to us about Mark chapter 13. We can clap for her if you want. We can clap for her if you want. <laughs> Um, so before we um, dive into chapter 13, um, can we do a quick recap of la the last chapter, which was chapter 12? So does anyone remember sort of the key things that happened um, in the last chapter? What do we read about? Yeah, so the widow who gave um, the two mites, and I think... The main lesson for me personally from that um, message was that love isn't the measure of the physical amount you give, but it's rather the sacrifice that you make. So for all the rich people who are putting in so much money, the real sacrifice they made there was quite small because that money wasn't really taking out of like something big that they had. Does that make sense? So the total sacrifice they had at the end was quite small, whereas with the widow, she might have only given two mites, but it was all she had, so she basically sacrificed everything. And so the measure of her love comes from the measure of the sacrifice and not the physical amount. And, um, and I think for us that's a really important message because when we're serving and we're, you know, trying to show God's love to other people, we sometimes forget that it's about the sacrifice and we get bogged down by the amount that we're giving um, and trying to show off, like, how much we're giving. Like, oh, you know, I'm free to do this and I'm free to do that and I'm free to, to do this, 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 this. But if you're free, like, all week and you go, like, help out, like, say, two days a week and someone who's, say, busy all week still finds an hour or two to give of their time, that sacrifice in God's eyes is worth more than someone who's totally free and only gives two days of their time. Does that make sense? So we need to really think about that when we're serving. You know, how much am I actually sacrificing um, versus how much I'm actually giving? Um, we also read about the parable of the, of the vine dresser. Um, remember that? And how, you know, we saw that Christ was exposing the Pharisees and what they planned to do to him um, in that parable. And we also saw that because obviously the Pharisees could tell that he was trying to expose them, that they got a little bit annoyed and they tried to trick him by asking him about the, the taxes. And they said, you know, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? And, um, and it's funny because, um, you know, they were hoping to stumble him there because if Christ said, yes, pay your taxes, people would be like, oh, he's not our saviour. Like he's, he's just here to make us, you know, pay more to the Romans. Like how can he be our saviour? But on the other hand, if he didn't say, if he said, yes, don't pay your taxes, like you're free from doing that, then the Roman soldiers would be like, oh, he's going to cause an uproar in the city. So they were hoping that it would cause him to stumble, but he was very, very wise in his response. And he told them, you know, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. And the way he showed us that was by looking at the coin. And he said, like, what image is on the coin? And a quick contemplation on that really quickly is, if you think about it, Whose image are we in? Are we in the world's image or Christ's image? And so if we're in God's image, therefore we belong to God. And so we need to remember that that means that everything we do needs to be for him. Make sense? Um, so that was essentially um, chapter 12. So we'll jump into chapter 13. But before we do, I want you to think of this chapter as the chapter of the signs. Okay, because here we're going to read all about... Um, Christ explaining to the disciples what the signs of the end of the ages will be, okay? And he does this in a really intimate setting um, where he's just with the disciples alone, um, talking privately. Um, now, if you think about why would Christ decide to have this kind of discussion right after the events from the last few chapters, um, you know, because in the last few chapters we saw that he cursed the fig tree and it shriveled up and then we saw him flipping the tables of the money changers in the temple. Um, 
you know, and so why now does he decide to talk about the second coming? And so the church fathers contemplate on this and say that the disciples probably felt after those like last few events um, quite discouraged and in a bit of despair because they're just like, oh, like, are we going to end up like that fig tree? Are we going to end up like those money changers where like everything just gets overturned? Like, what's the point, you know? And so Christ wanted to put their hearts at ease at this point and tell them and prepare them beforehand by telling them, these are the signs that are coming. Okay, these are what are the things that I need you to look out for. Because even though they're bitter to hear, because we'll, we'll read some bitter things shortly, but it's always comforting to know what to expect, yeah? It's always better to know when it's coming rather than to be taken by surprise. And so Christ was trying to give them that element of comfort that like, don't worry, here's what you should be prepared for. This is going to happen, this is going to happen, but don't worry because I'm going to pull you through it anyway. Okay, so this is, when we're reading through it, try not to be bogged down by the despair element of it and think of it as this is Christ's way of comforting us and reminding us, don't worry, this is what you should expect, but it's all good because I'm going to get you through it. Okay, so let's dive right in and see um, what some of these signs are. So um, can I get, Bish, can you can I get you started with verses 1 to 2, please? And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, amen. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be, overthr- shall not be thrown down. Okay. So Christ starts us off on chapter 13 with the temple. Now, the significance of the temple here lies in the history of, of it all. So if we look at what the temple meant to the Jews back in the day, we can see why. So when the, first, when the temple was first built by Solomon, okay, the Jews saw it as a sign of God's pleasure with them because it was something so grand and royal and it was something that, you know, all the kings from all the other nations were coming to come see. So they were like showing off, being like, look how much God loves us with this fabulous temple, okay? But then when it was destroyed during the period of the exile, okay, and during like the time of Zerubbabel and Ezra and those prophets, um, they rebuilt it, okay, with the permission of King Cyrus, um, as we read in Nehemiah and Ezra. Um, and it was again seen to like by the Jews that God's forgiven them. So, you know, yep, the, the temple is destroyed, but God's forgiven us, so we've been able to rebuild it now. Okay, and so... This new temple, whilst it may not have been as magnificent as the first one, it was still pretty great. And so at the time of King Herod, before the birth of Christ, around 20 BC, they started to do a huge reconstruction and, um, and like restoration project on the temple that actually lasted for so long. They lasted, I think, up until 60 AD, um, which was actually about seven years before it was completely destroyed again, as Christ predicted here. Um, and so if you think about knowing that the Jews saw the temple as this big sign of God's pleasure with them and God's forgiveness to them, when the disciples asked him here about the temple, it was as if they were wishing to hear from him that Christ was going to cleanse the temple or like he cleansed the temple just like he did with the money changers. Like the reason he did all of that was so that he can now come and reign from it like a royal king, you know, with his grand palace, okay? But Christ wanted to change that mentality completely. And that's why he flips it on its head um, and shows them that it's going to get completely destroyed. Because he wants to remind them, okay, that they're looking at this from a materialistic point of view, okay? And so he wants to shift their focus and go, it's not about the material world because that's going to get destroyed, okay? I want you to shift your focus to the spiritual and the heavenly kingdom instead, Okay, so this is a reminder to us about where our hearts are set. Are they set on the earthly temples or are they focused on the heavenly temple? Okay, and if God, if we were to look inside and find that, yes, okay, my heart is kind of set on the earthly temples, whether it be like our jobs or our 
status or our money or our like popularity or whatever it may be that we've got our heart on, if God was to utterly destroy that, would that make us shift our focus to him and the heavenly or would we find something else earthly to attach to? Okay. So keep that in the back of your minds, guys. So Christ here is trying to overturn the Jews' mentality here and be like, you think the temple is where I'm going to reign? No, no. The material world means nothing. It's going to get destroyed. Not one stone will be left unturned. Okay? And so Christ is saying, forget about that. That's not important. That's not where he's he, what he's here for, and that's not where he plans to reign from. Okay? Um, so let's continue with verses 3 to 13. Chris? Now he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when, will these, when these things will happen, or when these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up, rise again, rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. And there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. And you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for the testimony, test, test testimony that, yeah, to them and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations but when they arrest you and deliver you up do not worry beforehand or premeditate permit it, what you will speak but whatever is given to you in that hour speak that for it is, for it is not to speak but the Holy Spirit now brother will betray brother to death and the father is child and the children will rise up against his parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated, hated for, by all for my name's sake but he who endures the end shall be saved. So now that we like Christ has now shifted their focus to the heavenly he starts to talk to them about the signs of the end of the time. Um, and notice how he only starts to have this discussion with specifically the four disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Um, and now, and like he called, like they were the two by two that he first like called. So, you know, Peter and Andrew and then James and John. Um, and the church fathers contemplate on this in multiple ways. Um, but I think the two that sort of stood out to me the most was that these four disciples represent the four stones on which the Lord Christ built his church on, okay? And they also represent the four virtues that we need in order to enjoy heaven. Because if you look at each one of their names, each one of their names means a particular virtue. So Peter's name means rock, which means the rock of faith, okay, which we will base our entire um, relationship with God on, right? And then James or Jacob, that name actually means to chase. So that's reminding us of the persistent strife or wrestling that we have to go through in our spiritual lives. Okay? And John means compassion, which of course refers to the grace and the compassion of God. And then Andrew's name means seriousness or manhood, which refers to like obviously like going, working towards a goal with seriousness and, you know, without delay and being completely focused, okay? And so if you look at those four names, it shows you that essentially our entire spiritual lives are based on these four things, our faith, our ability to continue striving and wrestling against whatever powers are against us, God's grace and compassion towards us to overcome that strife, and then, of course, being completely serious and devoted in our struggles, Okay, and without those four elements, there is no eternal life. Okay, um, and the first sign that Christ gives them, so he starts off this, this whole passage about the signs with the first sign being the false Christs and prophets that are going to try to deceive humanity, okay, and that are going to try and push the devil's agenda. 
Okay, and I think the reason he started off with this sign is probably because it's the most important. Because it shows us that Satan isn't, isn't going to stop at anything to try and deceive us. Okay, and it's going to be the hardest thing for us to overcome. Okay, because as much as we hate to admit it, we are very easily fooled. Okay, and so Christ, like I said, he's trying to divert their attention from the temple. Okay. And focus more on the important things, being that the way of the Lord, like the way that he wants for us, is not an easy path. It's a narrow one, okay? And many people are going to be deceived along the way. And you know what I realized from this too? Um, St. Cyprian um, warned us that not only is it the devil who hides behind the name of Christ and, like, tries to trick us into thinking, um, you know, that he is doing the work of God, but... If you think about it, we ourselves sometimes do the same thing. When we walk around and call ourselves Christians, but we don't act according to the word of the gospel, then we're not really true Christians and we're kind of hiding behind his name, right? So we're no better than Satan who claims to be doing the work of God, but isn't. Does it make sense? Be very careful, guys, not to not to forget that we too can be at that at that point of weakness as well okay and so we need to ask ourselves and really especially like during this week of passion week really reflect and think am i just a christian by name am i a christian just in passion week you know going to church every week and you know being really good or am i really living by the gospel every day okay now, the second sign that Christ gives them is the sign of wars and disasters. And I actually think this sign is a very clever sign of God's because we always hear people say, and we've heard this classic example is last year and this year with the whole COVID pandemic, that the world is ending, okay? Like my mum, classic, she's like, Khalas, oh, am. like, it's the end of the world. I'm like, mum, relax. This isn't the first pandemic we've seen and it's not going to be the last, Okay. And if you look throughout all of history, okay, I'm pretty sure the people who lived through World War I and World War II thought the world was going to end then too, especially with the atomic bombs, right? So Christ, and Christ said it himself. He actually said to us, you know, when you hear of rumours of wars and rumours of wars, don't be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet, okay? So when the world around you seems to be falling apart, just remember what Christ said. He said, that's fine. I told you these things were going to happen. But the end is not yet. But it is a good reminder for us that our time on earth is limited. Because we may not live through the pandemic and other generations might. Okay, so it may not be the end of the world, but it may be the end for us. So we have to be careful okay, and use that as a wake-up call. You know, are we prepared? Are we ready for any moment? our lives to end okay and it's kind of like i know it's kind of depressing but we have to remember that these wars and disasters are not actually from god it's not his twisted way of like you know getting us to notice that the end of the age is coming you know oh let's let's throw a war in here or throw an atomic bomb there and hope to see who like realizes and wakes up to themselves no like god doesn't work that way Okay, but it's actually a tactic from Satan to distract us from what is really important. Okay, because all throughout COVID, everyone's focus was like, oh my God, we can't go to church. Oh my God, we can't, we can't exchange kisses. Oh my God, like we, we just can't. We have to stay in our homes. Okay, and it just distracts us from the main purpose, which is realigning ourselves back to God. Make sense? So it's not that God is uh, like causing these things to happen. But it's rather Satan's way of trying to distract us. Because remember I said Satan's going to stop at nothing to try and deceive us. Okay? And then Christ, um, but Christ is like giving us hope all throughout this passage, guys. Every time he gives us like a sign, he also gives us hope. So he said he, don't be troubled. The end is not yet. Okay? And then he shows us as well that the next sign, so... First sign, the world is going to be in turmoil. There's going to be wars. There's going to be like rumors of wars and all of that stuff. But then the second sign or the next thing is that now we're going to be in inner turmoil because we're going to suffer afflictions. We're going to be tested for our faith. 
okay? Because we're gonna be brought against councils and we're gonna be questioned and we're gonna be you know, tortured and, and hated for our faith, okay? And again, this is not God's way or twisted way of trying to remind us and be like, the end of the world is coming. Let me give you some turmoil to remind you. No. Okay, again, it is, it is Satan's way to try and break us, but God allows it, okay, because it allows us to share in his suffering, okay? But don't forget that, okay? Yes, Satan may try to break us, and yes, God is going to allow it, but don't forget that this is God telling you, here's your chance to share in my suffering, and by doing so, you then get to share in the salvation that comes after that. Make sense? Um, so, and he told, and so that's why he says from this, watch for yourselves, okay? So we need to make sure that we're alert, we're focused, and we know that all of these things are going to happen, but it's okay because God said they would and that he'd be with us through it all, okay? Um, and the other beautiful promise that comes from this as well is that despite all this turmoil and all this tribulation and all this up unrest, is that the preaching of the gospel will never cease, okay? And so he's reassuring us that God's work will, even though it will always be opposed, it will always increase in strength and splendor. And history is complete evidence of that, you know? Like during the time when the emperor uh, Diocletian and, and, the, and, and the era of the martyrs, okay, you would have thought that that would have scared Christians away and been like, okay, that's it, Christianity will die out. But no. More Christians, more people converted, more than they could ever control. Okay? So you find in those periods of darkness that that's when God's gospel shines and strengthens and grows. Okay? And that's God's promise to us. So we should take comfort in that. Um, and the other thing as well is he says here, like when, when, we, like when they arrest you and they deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So Christ is telling you, even if you get put to the test, don't worry, I'll give you the words to say. I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to leave you alone. Okay? So we need to hold on to these promises, especially during these dark times. Um, let's continue. And can you please read verses 14 to 23? When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Till, um 23. Okay. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those... Oh, sorry. Okay, so now we read about the abomination of, the, of desolation, okay? And this is what Daniel prophesied um, as a sign of the end of the ages in his um, uh, book. Now, there are several contemplations about this. Um, so some scholars think that the abomination of desolation refers to the entrance of enemy soldiers into the temple and defiling it. 
before they then destroy it and the city. Um, but other scholars say, no, the abomination was realised when um, Antiochus Epiphanes um, set the statue of Zeus um, in the altar of the temple in the year 167 BC. Um, and some say that this was then repeated when Pilate then set um, a statue of Caesar in the temple. Um, and when Calig Caligula um, tried to set for himself a statue in the temple also in the 40 AD. However, most scholars and most church fathers actually don't agree with these because the Greek text doesn't refer to the abomination of desolation through the setting of like a statue or um, the entrance of a pagan soldier into the temple. They actually instead think that the abomination of desolation um, is the appearance of a real antichrist um, who sets himself as a god in the temple. Um, and the reason for that is because in um, St. Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians, so can I get someone to open up 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4 really quickly? Because we'll read what St. Paul mentions about the abomination, and this is the popular belief of what Christ means when he says the abomination of desolation. Does anyone have it? Do you have it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Can you read it really quickly, Bish? Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Yeah, okay. So that's the more popular belief, that the abomination of the desolation is when a real antichrist will set himself as a God in the temple of God. Okay. Now Christ offers to his disciples hope again, because after giving us all the signs that we should look out for, he gives us some private commandments, if you read carefully, about how he's going to support us during this difficult atmosphere, okay? Um, and so these private commandments are, those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. He who is on the housetop, not go down into the house, nor enter or take anything out of his house. And him who is in the field, not to go back and get his clothes. So what does that actually mean? If you look at it in a literal sense, okay, it comes back from the time, um, like from history of the Christians back then. So whenever the Christians saw um, any signs of the nearness of the desolation of the temple, they would escape from Judea and um, head to the mountains, okay, so that they'd be spared from the siege of Jerusalem, okay? But if we look at it from a spiritual sense, okay, we can take something very special away from this, okay? If we want to encounter Christ, and be transformed and transfigured as he was, then we have to set forth out of the old Judaism. We have to leave the old Judaism behind where everything was very literal and by the law and, you know, there was no compassion, there was no mercy. Um, and instead we need to move to the mountains where we can be elevated, okay, to a spiritual freedom in the gospel, okay? Um, and so instead of being bound by the letter of the law like the old Jews were, Rather, we get to enjoy the gift of salvation, okay? Um, and so just as Christ warns his disciples to resist the Ro like the way to resist the Romans is to flee to the mountains, we too, if our fight intensifies with the devil, don't try to face him and don't try to like tackle him, but rather flee, escape and go and hide in the Lord's holy mountain, which for us is the church. So don't try to take on Satan when you feel like the battle is too hard, okay? Don't try to fight him. Don't try to coexist with it. It's kind of like, you know, when you have a, like, say, for example, you're tempted by a particular person, okay, or someone presents as like a, or like a, a weakness for you, instead of trying to live with it and coexist with it and be like, I'll be strong, I'll be strong, I'll be strong, and every time you fall, flee from it, leave. Don't try to pretend that you're strong, Okay? And so once we reach the mountains or the heights of our rooftops, and here's the key thing, and this is what, why he says, don't go back down and to your house and take things. Instead, he says, just stay there. So it's a reminder that once we reach that level of like spirituality where we're elevated and we're thinking about the heavenly kingdom, don't let the world pull you back down. Leave. Forget it. It's gone. Don't go back. 
Kind of like when Lot's, um, Lot and his family were fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, don't turn back. And what happened to his wife when she turned back? Turned into a pillar of salt. So once we're elevated, once we flee from the, like, the sin that's attacking us, don't go back to the world that's going to try and pull you back down. Okay? You know, like, and this is a silly example, but think about it. Like, you know when you guys are at work or, like, at uni or whatever and there's a fire evacuation and they say, don't try to grab all your things and run? Like, they just say, leave it and go? Same exact thing. Don't try to go back for things. Okay? In that time, flee. Okay? Um, now, in verses 19 and 20, again, we see Christ comforting us by reminding us that although it will be great tribulation, he's allowed those days to be short, okay, so that the elect doesn't, don't despair, okay? So even though he knows there needs to be a bad period for him to sort the good from the bad, because he loves us so much, he doesn't want the good to be few. So he's shortened those days so that the elect don't fall, Okay? Um, but again, he doesn't just comfort us. Again, he warns us, keep watch for Antichrist and don't let yourselves be deceived. Okay? Any questions so far? I know it's pretty dark, pretty like heavy, but remember, there's always hope. There's always like some comforting um, promises in there. Um, Uncle Negi, can you please continue verses 24 to 27? But in those days after the tribulation, that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Okay. So from these couple of verses, we can see that nature itself will collapse upon the return of Christ. Okay. And many church fathers believe that it will actually happen literally like that. Okay. That is, the material world around us is going to start to collapse to make way for the eternal world. Okay. The two can't coexist. Okay. And so some church fathers contemplate and say that the Lord Christ is the Son. Okay, and the church, his bridegroom, is the moon, and the believers are the eternal stars. So they say that as the Lord Christ, the son of justification, appears together with the church, his bride, the heavenly moon, and the believers who are the eternal stars, the earthly sun will disappear, the earthly moon will darken, and the earthly stars will lose their brightness before the new eternal heavenly scenery. Does that make sense? So the material world has to collapse to make way for the eternal world. And it's so nice to see that Christ won't leave his elect um, on his return, but rather gather them from the furthest part of the earth to the furthest part of heaven, Okay, which means that he's going to come searching for us and not leave a stone unturned until he finds us. Okay, He's not just going to be like, oh, yeah, whoever's there, it's all good. Take them, it's all good, done. No, he's going to search and actively seek us out Okay, to bring us into that kingdom that he's prepared for us. And St. Cyril the Great says, Christ does not come secretly nor in a vague way, but as the Lord God, he comes in glory that is fit for divinity to turn everything to the better, renewing the creation and reconstructing the nature of man. Okay, so that's the type of things we should be expecting at the end of the ages. Okay, so although it's quite dark and disturbing at first, it's so nice to see that Christ is going to come in all his glory and in all his power and, and create for us this heavenly world that like, we won't need the sun, we won't need the moon, we won't need the stars anymore. Make sense? Um, okay, um, Philip, can you please continue in verses 28 to 31? Now learn from the fig tree, which has already become tender and puts forth leaves, but summer is near. Do you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door? This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Okay. So Christ having presented to us signs of like his second coming, 
it starts to liken it to a fig tree okay so just like when we see a tree in spring start to blossom and the flowers come through we know summer is approaching okay it's the same with the second coming once we start to see these signs to occur we know that the second coming is approaching and for us the second coming represents the summer of eternity okay because we get to enjoy like his warmth forever now if we go back and look at the fig tree which christ cursed and we remember how that fig tree represented the jews who um uh like fell under the curse because they obviously they denied christ um we can see that just as that fig tree then returned to life so too is a sign of the second coming will be that the jews will come back and regain or like regain their faith through christ so that's actually what one, some of the church fathers say is that one of the signs of the end of the ages is that the jews will actually come back um, and they will repent and this is an interpretation that saint paul gives in romans chapter 11 verse 25 26 when he says hardening in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles has come in and so all israel will be saved so that too is also a sign in itself okay and so when christ said to them that this generation would by no means pass away till these things take place the church fathers say that it caused them to live their lives thinking that they will witness the second coming so because they're like oh this generation will by no means pass away until they see this so the disciples kind of live their lives thinking, okay it's gonna happen it's gonna happen when we're around you know um and so the church fathers like analyze this and said they must have like imagine the way they would have lived having that mentality you know it would have completely changed the way they behaved the way they worshiped like everything because everything was in preparation for the second coming that they were going to witness okay and so it's nice for us to think like imagine if we live with that same mentality that i'm going to live to see the second coming imagine what that would do for us okay would we be as complacent as we are now or would we be so concerned with the things of the world as we are now probably not because we'd realize it meant nothing when compared to the end of the ages right so if we were to live with this mentality that we could potentially live to see the second coming how much more would we be spending time with god in church and outside of church you know so use that as something to keep you guys from getting complacent and god didn't leave us to fuss over like he didn't want us to fuss over the second coming without first reminding us that even though our world may pass away god's word won't okay so yes the world may pass away it's going to be in turmoil we're going to see like um, you know, rumors of wars and nation will turn against nation and the sun will be darkened and the moon will be darkened and like all these negative things. But that's okay because God's word will never ever pass away. Okay, and we need to take comfort in that because that means that his promises will not be void. They will be fulfilled. Okay? So just remember guys that like, yes, we know like these are the signs for the second coming. But if we live with the mentality that we may see that happen, think about how much more inflamed and, and um, you know, inspired we would be to take our spiritual lives more seriously. Okay? Um, and then we'll finish off. Um, who's after Philip? Uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Can you please read um, verses 32 to 37? But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what i say to you i say to all watch okay so before he ends his talk with the disciples he tells them that no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father okay and there's a reason for that because he didn't want his disciples to sit there and fuss over exactly when the second coming was going to happen you know he didn't want them sitting there being like okay a war broke out here that means okay sign one's done where's sign, when sign two coming and when's this and you know what i mean he 
He wanted them to instead, who cares when it's going to happen? Just be prepared always. Okay? And that's why he gives them that, that warning of watch and be prepared. And he teaches us that, like, when he says, like, watch, he doesn't say just watch. He says watch and pray. Okay? Because there's no point in us watching if we're going to waste our time watching and doing evil things. Okay? Like, you know, because he likens it to a man who leaves and leaves his um, doorkeeper to keep watch. But if a person's keeping watch but, like, you know, playing games on the side or, like, getting distracted doing sin or whatever, is that a good watch? Would you trust your life if someone was to be keeping watch while you slept and doing that? Or would you think they're just they're not taking their job seriously? Right? So Christ is saying it's not about just watching. You have to it's about what you do during what we need to be doing is praying. Okay? And in this passage, Christ splits the night into four watches the, the evening watch, the midnight watch, um, the watch when the rooster crows, and the morning watch. Okay? And each of these would have been about three hours long. Um, and you can take each of these watches to represent like a different stage of your life. So like infancy, youth, adulthood, and then old age. Okay, And it shows us that we need to be watching and praying during all stages of our life. Because we don't know when the end of our life might be. Or if we may even witness the second coming during one of those stages. Okay, So just as we don't um you know like the way i kind of like to think of it and it's a little bit morbid but you know how like you know we know we're all gonna die right we know that's gonna happen but we don't sit there and fuss when it's gonna happen we don't sit there paralyzed at home be like oh my god i can't do anything because i could die today you know like it's no it's gonna happen but it's just there in the background but we prepare for it so like people will like write wills and they'll you know um get their affairs in order and take out like life insurance and do all these things in preparation for their death. The same thing with the second coming, guys. God doesn't want us to sit there and be paralyzed in fear of it, of it but rather we know it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but we just need to be prepared for it. And the best way to be prepared is to watch and pray. Okay? And like the disciples kind of lived thinking that they were going to live to see it in their own lifetimes and that motivated and inflamed like ignited that flame of like worship and service we too should live that same way okay because we don't know when the end is okay and again we shouldn't preoccupy ourselves with when exactly it will happen we just need to be ready and trust that god's promises throughout this entire chapter will all come through so when we are tested doesn't matter don't worry god will give us what to say when, when there's rumours of wars and, you know, there's tribulation around us in the world, don't be troubled. He said these things would happen. And it's okay. Because the end is not yet. All righty. Any questions? No. Nope. And glory be to God. Thank you, Maria. That was very nice. Um, all right, so I stand corrected. We're not off for, for two more weeks. We're only off for one. We have Bible study in two weeks. That makes better. Yeah. <laughs> so the next Bible study is in two weeks. It's the week after, um, or the Thursday, I should say, other, after the resurrection, the Feast of the Resurrection on, on the Sunday. So um, we'll be continuing um, with Mark chapter 14 um, then. Um, and keep keep watch over the um, of the WhatsApp group, and we'll we'll inform you guys of everything that's happening then. Um, just as a reminder, Passion Week is next week. Yeah, so there's no um, youth meeting either this Sunday because um, we've got Palm Sunday, and then we've got um, the week after that is um, we do have we do have uh, sorry Palm Sunday and then Resurrection. And then the week after that is the, um, is the next youth meeting. Um, as always, tonight there's food outside, guys, for, for anyone that wants to have um, a, a nice meal. And then back here at 9.30 for Tazbaha. And Mass is continuing. Um, this is the last week of Lent before Passion Week. So Mass continues tomorrow. It's the last 
Um, it's the Friday before the end of the fast. So the mass is the same tomorrow at 5 a.m., I believe. Is it? We'll, we'll confirm and, and let you guys know once we, um, once we know, but I, I believe it is still 5 a.m. Um, what time is it? Yeah. The 5.30. 5.30. Um, all right, so um, in Passion Week, all the, all the times and stuff like that are on the timetable. It's just yeah, outside in that corridor if you want to take a page or, or um, a schedule on your way out so you know all the times for Passion Week. Um, can we stand up for a prayer, guys? Lord, help us let go of our fear of failure. We know Satan wants us to use our fears to hold us back from living boldly for you. Forgive us for not living in faith and help us from this moment on to live with bold confidence in you. Lord, help us not compare ourselves to others around us. We pray instead that we keep our eyes on you and live a life that proclaims your excellence. Amen. The intercessions of St. Mary, St. Barbara, and all the saints, hear us as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come now, will be done on earth. We are the very peace of our trust.